Good. And with that, we're moving on to our last and final and one of the most famous speakers we have today. Uh, after that talk, we're doing the award ceremony for the young hackers outside. But let's listen to Mary Mo from Norway. Mark Burgess came out here from Norway, but I didn't meet before, he told me, at least he told me. And we have a second speaker from Norway, Mary Mo. And we talked about a lot of trust issues today and hidden trust problems. But there is nobody, or I've met nobody where the trust problem is so much focused like Mary. And literally her life depends on trusting software developers. I mean, a lot of your security offers, some of you are developers, but would you trust your life on your own code? I probably wouldn't trust my life on my own regular expressions because that's the biggest code I write most of the time. And uh, Mary will tell you why that is. Mary has a famous, I think, very famous TEDx talk. I mean, I saw that one. I was intrigued. I was very happy. I think uh, Karen Elazari made the, got us in touch. And I'm very happy that she made the trip to us. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a great honor to have the task of wrapping up this great conference today. So I'm going to talk about my heart today and my personal experiences with having to trust computer code. I am a security researcher, uh, but also I'm a patient. Every single beat of my heart is generated by a medical device a pacemaker implanted in my body. Seven years ago, I woke up lying on the floor. It turned out I had fallen because my heart had taken a break, long enough to cause unconsciousness. So to keep my pulse up and to stop my heart from taking pauses, I needed to get a pacemaker implanted in my chest. This little device monitors each heartbeat and sends a small electrical signal directly to my heart via an electrode to keep it beating. But how can I trust my heart when it's running on proprietary code and there's no transparency? When I got the pacemaker, it was an emergency procedure. So there was nearly, uh, there was no question about whether I needed to have the device or not. It was, however, time to ask questions. Questions that my doctors, my healthcare providers could not give answers to. Questions about the security of my device, whether or not my pacemaker could be hacked. The answers were unsatisfying. The healthcare providers could not answer technical questions about information security, and many hadn't even thought about the fact that this machine ins inside of me is running computer code. And there was little technical information available from the, ma the manufacturers of the device. This is why I decided to seek out this information myself. And I created a hacking project looking into the device that is actually running the code of my heart. Because I needed to know whether or not this device could be trusted. Seems like there's a problem with the, a technical problem with my PowerPoint presentation. Just a moment. Just have to restart the computer. So Luckily, this, doesn't ha this hasn't happened to my device before. <laughs> uh, never had to restart it. <laughs> but I did actually have to have a firmware upgrade of my device, uh, once that I'm going to also tell you about in this presentation. Let's see if uh, the computer works with me. Doesn't work. OK, let's try to force quit. Force quitting the PowerPoint. Let's see. Do 
This is not the type of problems you want to have in your pacemaker, obviously. <laughs> so let's see if we can find the presentation again. A moment. Do I restart it again? start. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> okay, so back to the slides again. So my life actually depends on hardware and software. And here you can see the insides of one pacemaker that we're taking apart in the electronics lab at Sintef. So my day job is that I work as a a researcher, uh, I'm a research manager for a team of 10 people that are working on InfoSec. Um, seven years ago, however, I was working for the Norwegian government uh, at their cyber security center uh, doing incident response. So my daily job was to, uh, was to deal with cyber attacks. So of course this was something that was on my mind when I then suddenly needed to have the pacemaker implant. And then a bit over three years ago, I quit my job. It was not because that job was boring or anything. I just wanted to move to my hometown in, in Norway. And I got a position at Sintef. And I started working as a, research, uh, as a security researcher. And at the time, I was talking, chatting to some of my cybersecurity uh, colleagues at the conference. And I came to this topic of my pacemaker. And I was saying that I have this pacemaker. Uh, I've tried to do some research to figure out if it's secure or not. And I'm not really trusting it. And then this uh, guy that was arranging a hacker conference, uh, he said, this is a super fascinating topic. So I want you to come and be a keynote speaker to, at uh, my hacker conference in Luxembourg. And I was like, wow, this is going to be way too personal. Uh, but then I thought about it for a while, and I decided, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be on stage in a room full of hackers, talking about the possible cybersecurity vulnerability inside of my body, <laughs> which was kind of scary. But also at the same time, I thought, what's going to be my main message to the audience? Um, and my main message was, we need more security research on this topic. And I was thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to go to this conference and complain that we don't have enough security researchers looking into medical devices. Why don't I just start a project on my own? So I did. I started this project. It was, at first, it was a hobby project. I got some medical devices um, bought at, in e at eBay. Uh, so I <laughs> shipped, to, shipped to my home. And we started opening th them up and we started hacking them. And after a while, this gained some publicity and also the attention of my employer, Sintef. And I actually got some internal funding from Sintef to start doing this in my day job, which I'm really grateful for. I also have a position at the Norwegian Technical University, where I teach a subject on incident response and ethical hacking. And I've been so lucky to be also supervisor of master students that had medical device security as their topic. So this is what we've done, or part of what we've done in the lab. We open up the things to try to figure out what's inside of them, what kind of ships are there. And it was not so easy with the pacemakers. These are really you know, uh, embedded devices with specialized uh, ships, and they were all blank, so it was not so easy to identify what's, what's inside of that pacemaker. But there are some other boxes that are a bit more cheaper and easier to get hold of than the actual pacemakers. Uh, that I'll get back to. But here you can also see actually how dependent I'm on the device. This printout, this is a snippet from 
uh, a paper printout that I asked for at the, the clinic when I went for a checkup. This is back in 2016, I did this checkup. And there's a lot of interesting statistics that is actually recorded by the device. And this is over the course of 24 hours. And you can see there's a straight line there at 100%. That's how often I'm using the pacemaker. It means that 100% of my heartbeats are actually generated by device. Uh, this is how often uh, my ventricle is being paced. And then the lower line, which is a bit more spiky, that's how often my upper chamber of the heart is being paced. And that's mainly during the night. And why is it being paced? It's due to a configuration setting. So my heart condition is something called an AV block. It means that the electrical signal that is generated by the sinus node in the upper heart chamber, it gets stopped on the way down to the ventricle, so it never reaches the ventricle. So that's why I need the, the constant little pacing of the ventricle. But there's a configuration setting in my pacemaker saying that my pulse cannot drop below 50 beats per minute. And that's why we get these spikes, because naturally, when I'm sleeping, sometimes my heart rate falls below 50. But then the pacemaker kicks in and also make sure that uh, my, my pulse is in the right uh, um, uh, range that is allowed in the configuration. So it was actually only a couple of weeks after I got the pacemaker implant seven years ago that I discovered how it feels like when the device is incorrectly configured, when there's something wrong with the device. This was the last uh, or the first time I was actually kind of stress testing my device after the surgery. So I was released after the surgery. Um, I think I only spent uh, uh, one week in hospital. And after I got the pacemaker implant, I was one week at home and then I was back at work. It was a really easy procedure. And the doctors told me, you can just keep living your life as before. So it's fantastic. This technology saved my life and I could just go back to doing whatever I wanted. I could run, exercise, do whatever I was doing before I got the implant. At least that was the message I got. So I was, I was back at work, and I think it was only four weeks after the surgery, I was sent to a course in London uh, together with some colleagues. One week course in ethical hacking and incident response, which was really good. Um, and we were riding the, the subway in London, and we went off at this, uh, a station that is called Covent Garden that's really far below the ground. Maybe some of you have been there. And my colleagues were just going for the stairs. There were some elevators there, but there were really long queues. So I just followed them. And I clearly did not read this sign, which says that there are 193 steps to climb, equal to a 15-story building. <laughs> it's kind of long stairs. And if you have heart conditions, please use the lift. And I hadn't really, uh, it hadn't really appeared to me that I had a heart condition at the time. And I was like, okay, I'll just go for the stairs. And I hadn't even, I haven't tried to exercise before this point of time after having the pacemaker. So I came about halfway up these stairs. And then suddenly it was like, I could not go on, it was so hard. I, I felt like an 80-year-old suddenly. It's like if you try to run a marathon or something and you just come to the station where your body can't make it anymore. And it, I, I sort of I managed to climb up, but it was really, really hard. And I felt like almost like I was going to die. But then I was at the top of the stairs. I regained my posture. I started breathing again and I could feel, okay, no, no, it's okay again. But there, something very strange happened. So when I came back from this uh, trip, I called the hospital and I complained. I was a difficult patient. I said, it's something wrong with my pacemaker. I cannot even walk up some stairs. Uh, I didn't say how long the stairs were though. <laughs> but yeah, I also tried like running for the bus and that didn't work either. It's the same feeling. And it turned out that there was a configuration problem with my device, but I didn't see this until after three months. The reason was when, when they, so when I go in there, there there's a device called a programmer, 
which is the device they use to interrogate my, my pacemaker, and also the, the device they use to, to configure different settings. And they were like looking at the screen, they couldn't make sense of this. And then I had to wait three months to get an exercise test under full monitoring. And then they immediately saw the problem. The problem was a default configuration that set, was set at 160 beats per minute. That was the highest pulse I could have with a pacemaker on these settings, which is very like, suitable for an 80-year-old, which is the normal pacemaker patient. So most patients that have these problems are, of, uh, are a bit elderly. But for me, as a 30-something, that was, of course, not enough for me. Uh, but the reason they didn't see this was actually a software uh, bug, I would say, in the user interface of that programmer. So the way they calculated the upper rate limit, uh, they input some values that were set, so I have some dynamic uh, delay values in my configuration. So it means that the higher pulse I have, the shorter is the AV delay, which maybe doesn't make sense for you, but but what they did was they input the number that was for the lowest heart rate into the formula that calculated the upper rate limit. And once you kick in and get at the upper rate limit, 160, the pulse is immediately shut down to 80 beats per minute instead. And that was why I felt so horrible and couldn't get enough oxygen and was feeling really, really out of shape. Uh, once they saw this, they could just insert the right values and now, theoretically, I can have a pulse of 200 beats per second, which is more than enough. So, per minute, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, anyway, this was something that, uh, that really uh, got me. I was thinking about this software, uh, like this software bug in this user interface. Like someone just made a small mistake in there. What else is in this code? So I searched for more information, and I found the technical manual of my pacemaker, which I read with great interest. What I discovered then was that my device has two wireless communication interfaces, two antennas inside of me, and I only knew about one of them. So that was a big surprise for me. So I made this high-level network diagram based on the information I found in the technical manual, so there's something called a near field, uh, inductive near field communication interface that is between the pacemaker and the programmer, the device they use to configure its settings. Uh, of course, I knew about this, uh, this uh, communication interface, and I'm really glad it's wireless. You don't want to be opened up every time you're going to, to adjust this, some of these settings. Uh, and it works uh, in a way that there's a, um, a wand uh, on the programmer so a device that you put really close, like centimeters from the device that initiate this communication. And I think that's great for uh, security because it means that even though, uh, so researchers have shown that this, uh, at least for some models, is really insecure. There's no real uh, uh, authentication on this wireless communication interface. So that was actually the only, um, reference I could find when I did a literature search back in 2011. There was one paper that was published in 2008 by a group of academic researchers uh, uh, at the University of Michigan, uh, led by Dr. Kevin Fu. And they had researched this, uh, this uh, communication interface and they found that it was possible to hijack it and do a man-in-the-middle attack on it because there was really no security at all. Uh, but the advantage is that if someone's going to attack you on that, they need to be really close to you and like uh, sort of bake their own custom programmer device and attack you with the device, which I think, I mean, there are easier ways to kill me and this would be highly, no, uh, you can really see that someone is trying to attack you if they, if they tried to do that. Uh, but then there's another um, wireless communication interface. It's something called, it's a, for telemedicine, something called a home monitoring unit. And this technology is uh, useful for a lot of patients, and a lot of patients use it. Uh, it's something that will, 
spare you for a lot of hospital visits because, because you get a remote checkup of your device. So the way it works is you have a, something that looks a little bit like a router in your home, typically maybe in the bedroom. And this sets up a, a wireless communication first called a medical implant communication service or MIX, which is a kind of specialized Wi-Fi for medical devices. It's uh, all proprietary, uh, of course. Um, and this communicates over a range of several meters. So you just have to be in the same room as this home monitoring unit. And then it can connect to your pacemaker, uh, withdraw uh, information from the pacemaker, and send it over the internet. And then there's a server, which is abroad at the vendors, where the patient data is collected. And there's a web interface, a web portal, where healthcare professionals can log on and see the patient information. Um, and this is all a kind of black box uh, for the patients. They don't see anything. This box is just standing, hanging around there in their, in their bedroom and automatically connects to their device and sends the report. And of course, this is good if you need a close follow-up of your condition. Uh, myself, I have not uh, um, activated this. Uh, uh, this is not uh, switched on for my device. Uh, I think it's not such a big hassle to go to the hospital once or twice a year to get these checkups. Uh, but of course, you can imagine an 80-year-old patient living in a remote island somewhere with a long journey to the hospital, that this is really good and beneficial. Um, but for me, uh, I would actually prefer to not have this uh, wireless uh, communication interface on my device thinking as a security researcher, like connecting medical devices kind of indirectly to the internet this way, it opens up a much larger attack surface, of course. And also when you think about the technology that is used in these devices, uh, it's old, already outdated technology and it's filled with security holes. Um, at the time, there was no research done on this when I started my project, but since then, uh, some more research has been published, and we also have some findings that we are still doing vulnerability disclosure on. Um, it so part of the problem is, of course, the long lifetime of these implanted, embedded <laughs> devices, embedded into people. Uh, the lifetime of, uh, battery lifetime of my pacemaker is 10 years. And also, it takes a long time to get these products um, um, on the market because there's really, really strict safety regulations. Uh, so I talked to some developers in this area and they said it would not be unreasonable to think that it would take five years from you design the product until you were allowed to sell it. Uh, so some of the technology that we found when they opened these boxes is like early 2000s. And this is connecting to the internet. So what could possibly go wrong? So there's a lot of issues here. I mean, when I first started to talk about this, I was met with some critical questions like, why are you worried about this? About this? Who would want to hack a medical device? Uh, but I mean, there's a lot of issues that, can, uh, that uh, we should think about. Of course, there's patient privacy issues. These devices collect a lot of very sensitive data. Uh, how is this data treated? Um, can the patient data get lost in, in, one of, uh, in this ecosystem of devices? Um, and then there's battery exhaustion attacks, which is a kind of DDoS for medical devices, which is kind of scary. Uh, the issue is that the, uh, so the battery is drained much faster when you're communicating with, with the device, uh, then, so, so when, when the device is used to just keep the heart beating, there's a very, very small amount of electricity that is needed. But when you set up wireless communication with a pacemaker, it's draining the battery much faster. So a possible battery extortion attack, attack is just to start communicating with the pacemaker and making it respond to your communication, then you can drain the battery much faster. And of course, that could be critical for someone like me that's 100% dependent on the device. And also, it would require a surgery 
to replace it because these devices are not remotely chargeable. You have to replace them if the battery runs out. And then it's possible to program it or configure it in ways that makes it malfunction, uh, not suitable for the treatment it's supposed to give. And then you can think about worse things like death threats and extortion. We have a lot of examples of ransomware attacks where also hospitals have been hit pretty bad, even though that was not necessarily targeted towards the hospitals. Some hospitals had um, not good enough network security so that this also spread into their systems and prevented patient care. Um, but what about ransomware that actually gets on the medical device where you have to pay a big sum of money to stay alive? That would be really, really scary. And then there's this more targeted scenarios that, will, that, I mean, depends on your threat model, but if you're a really high profile person, you would be maybe also worried about some remote assassination scenario. Some of you might have seen this in the Homeland episode, uh, but it's actually quite realistic. So previously, uh, the previous vice president of the US, Dick Cheney, he had a pacemaker, and he got the wireless uh, functionality physically removed, disabled on his device, because they were worried about this kind of scenario. It's not something that I go and worry about uh, day to day. Uh, so yeah, I started this hacking project, and some of these devices are really easy to get hold of. Here you can see examples of these home monitoring devices from three different vendors that uh, I have in the lab. We have uh, plenty more of those. Uh, I could get them on eBay for $20. So it's not really a big expense. And the reason these are easy to get hold of, I think, is maybe um, an old uncle passed away, uh, relatives are cleaning up his apartment, they found these electronic things, they dispose of, a, of it to an uh, electronic reseller, and then it's put on sale. And I was actually also able to find a pacemaker programmer on eBay, which can be used to configure my device. It cost me $500, but I thought, okay, that's not too much to spend to be able to get hold of this code that I'm so curious about. So, um, two of my students last year, they were focusing on this programmer and reverse engineering some code in there. And it was a really huge code base. And uh, one comment from one, one of the students was, uh, so he usually studied malware reverse engineering. And he, he said, uh, this code uh, inside of this programmer is almost indistinguishable from malware. <laughs> it's, so, it's so messy. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there was one researcher that maybe some of you know about, Barnaby Jack, uh, that uh, did some pioneering work on this field. So I want to mention him. He was supposed to give a talk at Black Hat in 2013 about how he had reverse engineered uh, one of these uh, uh, pacemaker vendor's devices. Uh, he had a script on his laptop and an antenna, and he was able to, he had a proof of concept where he could scan the room. If anyone in the audience had a pacemaker, he could get the serial number of the device, and using this he could also man in the middle of the communication to this device and remotely configure it to deliver a shock. So, Unfortunately, he passed away just a week or so before he was going to give this talk. Uh, but some of the research has been carried on with other researchers that I'll come back to. I um, just want to say that medical devices, of course, they save lives, but they also take lives. And the problem is you don't know how many uh, have died because of malfunctioning devices. Um, some researchers tried to figure out how many die of medical error, and they saw that it was actually the third biggest, death, biggest cause of death in the US. Uh, the problem was there's no checkbox on the death certificate saying that this is what caused the death. So that was why it was a bit hard to, to figure it out. But there's a lack of testing of user interfaces. Uh, Professor Harold Timbleby has done some great work on, on this. Uh, he's published a lot of papers on how uh, user interfaces and medical equipment can kill people. And there's an insufficient reporting of adverse events. I had an adverse event, and I myself experienced how difficult it was to get this reported. 
And there's uh, many of these devices that are missing logging and forensic capabilities, unfortunately. They're not built in such a way that you can easily figure out what went wrong with them. So even though we don't have any documented cases of, of anyone dying of hacking of medical devices that I'm aware of, doesn't mean that it never has happened, because many of these never get investigated. So I had an adverse event. Um, two years ago, I was on my way to give a talk at a conference in the Netherlands. And while I was flying, my device, or me, I was hit by cosmic radiation. There's more cosmic radiation in, the, uh, in that height, in the atmosphere, which caused bit flips in the memory of my device. Uh, this is a pretty freak event. It doesn't happen that often. It happened for me. I do fly a lot. Maybe that's why. Uh, so this is a known problem. So electronics that is meant to put, be put up in the, in the air, they usually have a lot of uh, mechanisms to prevent this from happening. Um, I was just sitting in the airplane, and usually I don't feel anything when my device is pacing me. But then suddenly I could feel it, which was kind of freaky. And I looked down at my chest. I could see my chest muscle involuntarily uh, twitching in the rhythm of my heart, which I never experienced before. So I told the, uh, the air, airplane crew, and when we landed at Schiphol Airport, there was an ambulance waiting for me, taking me directly to the hospital. And that's a picture of me in the hospital the next morning. And I looked pretty happy. And that, this is because I was just told uh, that this is not a mechanical failure of your device. Uh, it's something that can be fixed by a firmware update. <laughs> so I have in front of me, you can see there's a tray, uh, like a tray with four different programmers on it. Uh, this is because there's no interoperability between these devices. So when you come into hospital, you need to know who is the manufacturer of your device to be able to take the right programmer that can communicate with it. Um, this is the face of the pacemaker technician who is looking at the screen, and he sees this data error that is never seen before. <laughs> so, uh, error message uh, from my pacemaker. Initialize factory settings. Uh, so my pacemaker was in a backup safety mode, and I'm really happy some engineers made this device so that it had a hard-coded mode that would keep my heart beating in case there were any problems with, with, the, with the code. So my heart was beating uh, 70 beats per minute constantly, and they had switched off the volume, so it was giving me maximum of the electricity, which is why I felt this really weird feeling. <laughs> um, and it says here, to resume normal pacemaker function, select memory dump and reinitial bu reinitialize button to send the standard program to the pacemaker. This was, uh, takes several minutes. So that was what happened. Uh, the, the memory was reflashed. I got a new firmware written to my device, and it was back in factory settings. Um, luckily, since I'm this difficult patient, I always ask for this uh, uh, paper printout of all of my settings when I'm in the hospital, because they didn't have my settings. Like, they, how were they going to reprogram it uh, for me in the Netherlands? Uh, I tried calling my local hospitals, no one answered the phone. Have you ever tried calling hospitals? They never answered the phone. Uh, but I, I got in, uh, in touch with my colleague, because I knew I had this paper printout out in my office, and asked him to scan it and, and send it to me on an email. So we got the printout, we got all the settings, uh, they reconfigured it, and I was released from the hospital, and I could give my keynote talk the next morning. Um, and one more thing, which was really, helping my research project was this memory dump. Uh, there was actually a crash file created, uh, a zip file on the programmer uh, with my data on it. So I just uh, said politely, um, this is data from my heart, from my pacemaker. I would like to have a copy of that data, please. And I gave my USB stick to the pacemaker technician and he plugged it into the programmer uh, and I got a copy of that file. So it turned out that file was encrypted, by the way. Uh, 
But then I also contacted the vendor and I asked for my data, and they, get, were also give, they also gave me a copy of the data. So I had two files, one encrypted, one unencrypted, and I handed this to my students. And I said, can you please uh, recover my data? Uh, and uh, uh, they reverse engineered the programmer, and they figured out how this encryption worked. And I'm also then a lucky uh, p uh, possession of a memory dump from my heart. And this is how it looks like. So it was really a victory. I've been working on the project for a couple of years, trying to get hold of the data inside of me. And here you can see some of it. But trust is broken. Other researchers have also found vulnerabilities in this, um, uh, in, this uh, in, in other pacemaker vendors' products. Uh, most famous case, I think, is Sanitude Medical, which has now been purchased by Abbott. There was, very, there was a big controversy around this because the researchers decided to do quite non-traditional way of vulnerability disclosure. So they partnered with an investment firm called Madhu Waters. Uh, and Madhu Waters' business model is to find rotten companies, to short the stocks, and then make a lot of money on it. So what they did was they shorted the stocks in Sanitude Medical, then they released a report about security vulnerabilities in pacemakers, and as you can see, the stock price fell down, and they made a lot of money. And this is how they financed their research. Um, of course, this created a lot of confusion and problems for patients that didn't know uh, what to think about this news. And there were no advisories from uh, the regulator, the FDA in the US, on this at the time. Uh, and uh, the, the vendor, St. Jude Medical, they said, no, we don't have any security vulnerabilities, and they responded by suing the researchers. But then, this happened in August 2016, and then in January 2017, almost six months after, they had to uh, just say uh, that there was a security advisory coming from the FDA saying, yes, there are cybersecurity vulnerabilities in these devices. Uh, it turned out uh, the researchers had been able to get a, a shell on this home monitoring uh, device from Sanjit Medical. Uh, they could upload their own firmware, which contained some attacks on pacemakers, uh, the battery draining attack, but also an attack that could make the device deliver a shock. And this was verified also by a third party. Um, there's a great blog post from uh, uh, Matthew Green, famous cryptographer on this topic. He was one of the people scrutinizing this research, and he found that actually the programmer commands are authenticated through an inclusion of a hard-coded three-byte, 24-bit um, key, uh, so, they had, so they had actually made their own version, sort of, of uh, RSA using a 32-bit key length to try to authenticate this thing. As I, uh, I studied cryptography myself. I have a master's degree in mathematics and cryptography, and this really makes me feel uh, bad when I know about this horrible cryptography in, inside of these devices. And it took, actually, so this was in January 2017, it took, actually, one full year from these vulnerabilities were first disclosed until there was a patch available for fixing this inside of the pacemakers that were inside of people's bodies. And the, the way you get this patch is you have to go into the hospital, get hooked up to the programmer, and then the programmer delivers this software update to the patient. And there's a risk involved in case something goes wrong, in case like happened to me on stage now, in case uh, there's a problem with this new firmware. Uh, this could be potential patient risk. So some of the doctors that I've talked, about, uh, talked to about this um, uh, say that, uh, no, we're not giving this firmware updates because we don't think it's, uh, uh, it's a high enough risk of the patients to be hacked. So the risk of, uh, of the firmware update uh, messing up something with the pacemaker is higher than the risk of this patient getting hacked. How many doctors have the competence of making that cost-benefit analysis? This is a field that is kind of 
new for them, I would say, and not part of their profession. So this creates a big challenge when doctors must communicate with patients about cybersecurity risk of their devices. So I need to wrap up. I see you're, you're getting closer and closer here. <laughs> uh, I don't want to keep you uh, too long. But I just want to say, on my, on my spare time, I participate in a group called uh, I Am The Cavalry. And we have been doing some, we are just a bunch of volunteers that care about these things. And we have published something we call a Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices, which is like five design principles that we're trying to get all the vendor manufacturers to uh, adhere to. And one of them is that it should be able to actually produce cyber security updates. Uh, it shouldn't take one year until this happens. But then again, software updates can be malicious too. This is a Medtronic programmer. And just uh, start of just a couple of weeks ago, news came out that Medtronic had disabled remote updates for their, their pacemaker programmers because of security problem. If you read the advisory, it says that the affected product uses a virtual private network connection to securely download updates. The product does not verify it is still connected to this virtual private network before downloading updates, which means you can actually hijack this and insert your own updates into the programmer if it's internet connected. So they're taking these off the internet now uh, to protect them, which is good, I think. And so I want to just wrap up by saying, for me, of course, the benefits of having the device outweighs the risks. And since my device was fixed, configuration was set correctly, I've been able to run. Uh, I finished two half marathons so far, running with a pacemaker. And on Sunday this week, I'm going to finish, uh, hopefully, a full marathon in New York. So running with a device. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And good luck with the marathon.